Hello, and welcome to the Armin Show podcast, science, people, creativity, learning more. Subscribe if you haven't. YouTube, Spotify, all the places. The show continues to grow with clips, long form, short form, whatever it might be. On this one here, we have a wonderful guest coming from Helsinki, Finland, the author of this fabulous book, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable. We have Mikko Hippinen. Mikko, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armin, and thank you for having me. I'm very glad to have you on. You are a global cybersecurity expert with over 30 years experience working as a researcher and investigator and are a lecturer, have been profiled in Vanity Fair. Your TED Talk has been viewed more than 2 million times and you have a solid area of expertise in this category. Before we get into the book, what has got what got you into that range of category in the first place? Was there something about your personality that led you in that direction? Why cybersecurity? Mm, it was random. I got started in cybersecurity very early on. Um, I was a programmer as a teenager. I sold my first games that I wrote for Commodore 64 when I was 17. Um, but the the jump to cybersecurity was basically just random. I happened to end up working in a company doing database development. And one of the things the company did was analyzing early viruses, which were spreading on floppy disks at the time. This is 1991. Um, and I had low level expertise because I had written assembly code on old home, home computers. So I was assigned to try to reverse engineer some of the malware we were receiving as samples in the mail on floppies. And, and I succeeded and I, I was good at it. So I got assigned to do more of it. And eventually I did nothing except that. So when the problem started appearing, I was right there in the very beginning, but it was more random than anything else. That's cool. Long live the time of floppy disks and the early period. As far as my background and connection with what is written here, my brother got us early on. We had a PC, we had a 486 in 1990, I don't know, three, four. And at the time I thought me and everybody else had computers, but later I realized we were some of the first 0.1% maybe that were really using computers mm -hmm. in total. And I had a collection of floppy disks and organized files and zip and RAR things and all kinds of cool stuff. And so a lot of a good chunk of the early part of your book took me back to the, because the worms you mentioned or some of the viruses, I saw them as they came up, you would download things. And I got this mm -hmm. thing and you saw it from the other end. So what led to the writing of this book? Why do you want to let people know that if we have all these smart items, there's vulnerability What's the impetus for it? Well, the book covers a lot of the different lessons that I've learned over these 30 years. The title of the book is a play on the Huppen and law. When things become smart, when we add functionality and connectivity into everyday devices, yes, we get benefits, but we also get new problems. If it's a smart device, it's a vulnerable device. If it's programmable, it's hackable. But that's only one of the topics I cover in the book. Um, I, I, I like to go through, or I tried to go through the, the revolution, as I believe we are seeing right now, because I believe we are sitting in the middle of the biggest technological revolution in mankind's history, where the importance of geography is disappearing forever. The mankind walked this planet for 100,000 years offline we got online during our time, during our generations, and now we will be online forever. And that's how we will be remembered. All future history books will describe our generations as the first generations who got online. And that's sort of a com comforting thought because these things regularly seem complex and confusing and that's okay none of this has never been done before or none of this has ever been done before and that's comforting it's 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 going to be much easier for future generations right now we can split the people around you into two groups the people who remember the time before the internet and the people who don't if you're roughly 25 or 30 years old you don't remember the time before the internet this is true, that separation. You can see the bigger picture of it because you work with it for so many years. That's where you get the broader view. That's a huge separating point. And those the, the, who... the, 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 There's fun fact. I was born in 1969, that the year when we went to the moon, the mankind went to the moon. I was actually born two, uh, like, hold on, six weeks before the first version of internet was generated. 
the ARPANET, the first packets were being sent over the first servers, which are connected to what we call today the internet. So when people ask how old is the internet, I always tell them it's it's this old. I'm 53. Internet is 53 years old. I was born somewhere between the first moon landing and the invention of the internet in 1969. That's some cool placement right there and gives some good structure. It's good to attach things to what happened at certain time frames. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, I, I think about that at certain key points of where the internet adjusted this way, or a lot of people joined onto it when it got easier. And that was a big part of what expanded the internet when it became way easier to use devices and whatnot for regular individuals. Now, as far as if we brought people to, I kind of want to bring people to today and then go back in time. If we look at today, what are the items that we look at most in terms of vulnerability or what people should be thinking about? And then we'll go back into where it came from. Right now, the most likely risk affecting companies are ransomware and business email compromise, which is also known as CEO scams, social engineering, the financial department to steal money from companies. And of course, ransomware, which we all know, tries to encrypt the files in, in your company. But those are typically targeting enterprises or organizations, public sector maybe. When, when individuals get hit, it's something different nowadays. It's typically losing access to your accounts, someone steals your Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp or something like that, gains access to your bank account, gains access to your credit card number, um, gets your password, and then you realize that you use the same password everywhere. And this is especially bad when you lose access to your email. Let's say you have Gmail. If someone steals your Gmail, now they get into almost everything else because all online stores and everything else, the login page has the button which says, I have forgotten my email. Oh, sorry, I have forgotten my password. And if the attacker gains access to your email, they can try logging into all of the other services with the same email and click the button, which will send a new password to the email, which they already have. So that's the kind of problems home users face. So it's, it's quite different for companies and, and home users. And the bigger the company is, the more likely it is that it's 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 hacked. How many of the Fortune 500 are hacked right now? The answer, 500, every single one of them. Because if you're a Fortune 500, you have hundreds of thousands of workstations. And if you have hundreds of thousands of workstations, you have a breach somewhere in your network right now, whether you know it or not. That took me back to the visual somewhere in the book about where an individual got to get to the mainframe of the system and actually took a picture with it, showcasing that I got into the, the, the system. Those little things are nice visuals for me. Mm -hmm. Now, that's important for the users. And then yes, there's the companies. Early on, I would say it was much more, in your descriptions, it was more simple, simpler times, we could call it simpler in the past. And some of the early parts give me nostalgia. Can you tell us about the growth of the early malware, the worms that spread, and the people behind them, which you described some of them, were they, what was their intentions? For the first 15 years, almost 15 years of my career when I was analyzing viruses and hunting criminals, criminal hackers, the enemy was very simple. It was always the same. It was always teenage boys. Teenage boys who were writing viruses for fun. Um, they had no other motive. They were not trying to make money. They were not trying to become famous. They had no message. They had no political uh, message to send. And they were always boys. My theory is that there were plenty of girls writing viruses as well, but they were smart enough not to get caught. So we never, never heard about them. But if somebody would have told me, told me then, in the beginning of my career, in the 1990s, that eventually the enemy will change, and it won't be teenage boys writing viruses for fun, instead we'll start seeing malware coming from organized online crime gangs, which are making millions and millions with their attacks, or that we will start seeing malware created by governments, 
Uh, we would see law enforcement agencies use viruses to investigate crimes. We would start to see intelligence agencies do global spying with backdoors and Trojans, or that future wars would have a new domain for war. We would expand from the physical domains to cyber. All of that would have sounded like complete science fiction in the in, in the 1990s, but all of that happened. Today, it's not teenage boys. It's organized crime, operating online, having uh, crime having gone completely global. Crime used to be local. It used to be local criminals hitting local shops and local banks. Today, it's global. Geography has disappeared. And the same thing applies to the other shifts we've seen. It's global crime, nation states, governments, intelligence agencies, and the military behind the attacks we see today. Two questions come to mind from that. One of them is, for the average person, things have become much more disconnected in all categories, such as in even uh, shopping and retail, everything is further away, something randomly arrives at your door. Same thing with security, or such as you're describing, it was more local versus now, could be from who knows where, some other country, and the people are anonymous and protected. With you having a broader view of the globe, are there still surprises, or are you able to see the whole thing as um, it's not, there's not much surprise, you just have to look at it at a huge view? Internet took away geography. There's there's no geography on the internet. It's it's um, there's no distances. There's no borders, and that's great and that's awful. Um, one sentence I keep repeating in the book is that internet is the best thing and the worst thing which has happened during our lifetime, and the benefits of of geography disappearing are are pretty obvious. Companies can do businesses worldwide. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where your customers are. Our company, WitSecure, sells security services around the world. Most of our customers have no idea that we're coming from Finland. They've never even heard of Finland, but they still use our services because it doesn't matter where we are. And that's great. Another upside is that it's so much easier to find people like you. Humans are social animals. We, we, we like to be we like to be among people like ourselves. We like to be around people who agree with us, who have the same interests, who have the same hobbies. And if you had a rare hobby before the internet, you were really alone. You might be the only person in your town who, had, who, were, who was collecting model steam trains, let's say. Then internet comes along and you'll find forums full of people collecting steam trains, people just like you, they're just not close to you. But now you found them, you know that you're not alone and you have people to, you know, talk about the things that's, that's interesting to you, especially for minorities. Internet was a great, um, great change. Now, the downsides are as obvious. Internet really changed crime and risks, but it also um, enabled, how should I say, it, destructive minorities to do evil things. For example, people who fantasize about school shootings or people who want to join an extremist movement and kill people, they will find exactly the same kind of support like someone who has a rare hobby. So we, we, we can't just pick the upsides from this revolution. We get the downsides at the same time. And this applies to, to risks and crime. Um, it changes our lives even more when we're living in, you know, fairly safe Western countries. Finland is a great example. Crime rates are really low over here. There's no street crime, very little drug crime. Corruption is, this is the least corrupted country on the planet. Very safe. Then the internet revolution happens. And suddenly we Finns are no no more secure when we go online than anyone else who goes online. So when me and my, my neighbors, we, when we chat in the yard, it's actually a very safe place. You could leave your doors open, nothing's going to happen. Then we, when we get inside and sit down at our computers, we are as close to any, any online criminal than any other victim anywhere else on the planet. And this is easy to say, but it's kind of hard to really digest and understand how much it changes our lives. My, my favorite factoid around this 
is the amount of bank robberies um, we had in Finland in, in 19, uh, well, 30 years ago. Around 120 bank robberies a year. So twice a week, somewhere in Finland, someone would go and rob a bank. Like walk into a bank with a gun, typically a rifle, because this is hunting, hunting uh, country. And they would go and steal cash. Now, the last time we had a bank robbery like that was 12 years ago. There are no longer bank robberies in Finland. There's two reasons for that. Reason number one, we've gotten rid of our banking networks. There's only very few physical banks left, which are in the biggest cities, and the few banks we have left, they have no cash. Especially Northern Europe has is no longer using cash for almost nothing. So why would you go and walk into a bank because there's no cash to steal? And that doesn't mean that bank robbers would have disappeared. It means that bank robbers have digitalized their work, just like everyone else has digitalized their work over the last 30 years. Today's bank robbers don't walk into banks to steal money, cash. Instead, they use banking trojans to insert extra bills into transactions when someone does online banking from an infected computer, or they use keyloggers to seal credit card numbers when people do online shopping, or they break into cryptocurrency exchanges to steal Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, and Zcash. And the difference between the bank robber of 1993 and 2023 is that the bank robber 30 years ago was was from within the 10 mile radius of the bank. People were robbing their own bank. They were local criminals. And today's bank robbers are not local. They could very concretely be on the other side of the planet. That's the difference. That's how crime has changed from local to global. That's a great separating point there. Immediately, that makes me think directly, what's the, what would you say are the most similar things between 2023 and 1993? A wonderful time, I would call it. No, well, maybe the ever-changing, increasing computing capability. I mean, computers were getting so much faster every year and they are still getting so much faster every year so much more storage so much more memory so much more processing power you remember when you had your 486 a year later people had pentiums and it was like 10 times faster and it's it's crazy and and it hasn't ended um and that's that's really exciting and it enables completely new kinds of things like we've seen just over the last six months we've seen so great uh, expansions in things what computers can do today, like AI, the, the GPT, which is exciting and scary at the same time, that would not have been possible before. We didn't have the computing capabilities to do this kind of modeling until now, and now we're doing it. That's true. There were quick upgrades. It was like 386, 46, 486DX, then the Pentium, Pentium 2, and the thing, Celeron was not as good and so on. Long yeah, the upgrades. My, my first PC was 386DX, 25 megahertz. I still remember that. Ours, the one that we got was 40, but you could press the turbo button and it would go back to 8, and then you could go back to 40. You Do could you switch know why they, why they had the turbo button? I think I read about, uh, to, I think to slow it down at times. It's yeah, something if like... You, if you were running old games on a modern PC, modern at the time, they were too fast. So you, you clicked off the turbo button. Great branding. It, it really was the slow down button. But they claim that it's a turbo button, makes it faster. You would never know. We'd never, and then later you, that's good. That's good maneuvering. And like overclock later and under. Mm. Oh, and oh, then yeah. actually on the concept of games, I have to throw that in there just for my own personal idea. Do any of these, all these uh, Wolfenstein and Wacky Wheels and Commander Keen and Doom and these, do these all come to mind for you? Did you participate in Unreal and Raptor Call of the Shadows and Tyrion, any of these? Well, I, I played all of them, um, yeah. but uh, that that's it. I, uh, I remember we had a um, company-wide license for Wolfenstein 3D, which then later on, the Doom came out right after that from the same company. Oh, yeah. We had the biggest screens we had in the company set up to play. Then we were playing late in the night, having local LAN parties at the company. Um, good old times. I, uh, I don't play many modern games, but uh, those old games are still very close to my heart. I also do not play modern games as well. So at some point I could not play games anymore, but before that, when I was younger, they were great and I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Now, long live that time. 
Um, now, <laughs> I have to say, now, returning to, uh, we talked about crime, but also you had mentioned uh, war. And I was wondering, in war, is it continuous that attacks are always happening between nations? Or when there is something that is more warlike, does it suddenly become like an extreme point of attacks? How would you describe it? Like continuous versus like uh, staggered, I guess. Whenever mainstream media uses the word cyber war, um, they are almost always describing something different than what's real cyber war. Media loves the word and, and they throw it around whenever there's like a denial of service attack from a random gang against, I don't know, House of Parliament in some country, they, and the headlines scream about cyber war. That's not cyber war. That's not war. Like an attack cannot be cyber war if there isn't a war. Cyber is one of the domains where modern wars are fought out. Technology has always shaped the way we fight our wars and the way we we settle our crises. Initially, the best technology we had to fight each other was swords and bow and arrow. So for years and years, all the wars we fought were land wars because we had no better technology until we got good enough technology to build warships. And the invention which took war from land to sea didn't actually move wars from land to, the, to sea. They expanded. Now we were fighting on land and on sea. Same thing happened when we had good enough technology to invent war planes. We went to air war, but we we're still fighting in the old domains as well. Then we invented satellites, space war, and now cyberspace war. And when you look at modern wars, Russia, Ukraine, that's a great example. Right now, at this very moment in Ukraine, they are fighting on land, on sea, in air, in space, and in cyberspace. And I don't think we will ever see a war between two countries which would only be fought in cyber. That's not the way wars work. They are fought in all of the domains we have. And cyber, the fifth domain, is not going to be the last domain. Um, you could describe or split this in other ways as well. Some people would claim that financial would be a domain for war or, or psychology or information warfare. But when we try to think what might be the next, next technological breakthrough, just like cyber was the last one. That's an interesting thought, because right now we don't know what it's going to be. The only thing we know about the sixth domain, which eventually will appear, is that whatever it is, right now it's going to sound like science fiction. I'll give you an example. The sixth domain for warfare, which would be reality in 30 years, might be something like nano warfare, where an army would distribute airborne aerosol-like nanobots in the battlefield, which would enter the bloodstream of enemy soldiers, go into their brains and change their thoughts. Does that sound like science fiction? Yes, it does. Exactly like cyber war sounded like science fiction 30 years ago. So we don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be something which we can't really imagine at the moment. So most of the attacks between countries, most of the attacks launched by governments and nation states are not about war. They're, it's about cyber espionage or cyber sabotage. And cyber espionage and sabotage happens all the time. Cyber war only happens during wars, like Russia, Ukraine right now. Um, when, for example, the United States launched the Stuxnet attack against Iran, that wasn't cyber war because USA was not at war with Iran. It was cyber sabotage. It was a sabotage done with cyber attacks, which was designed to destroy physical things. Now, if there would have been a war at the time, the very same attack would have been cyber war because it was a cyber attack designed to destroy physical things. If you do that during wartime, clearly we would label it as cyber war. But since there was no war, it was just cyber sabotage. And the most common usage of cyber power by nation states is espionage, espionage or spying. And that's actually really obvious because spying has always been about stealing information and information used to look like this. 
information used to be physical. It used to be on paper. It used to be something you could steal. Like the notes I have written down here, if you wanted to steal them before the internet, you had to come to me and steal this or copy this or photograph this. So spies used to do the James Bond stuff. They used to go to where the information was. Then information changed. Today it's, you know, this is the information. So you don't have to physically go and steal the thing. You can hack into the thing and you can do that from anywhere on the planet. So the work of spies has changed. It has, well, I used to say it has moved to the online world, but I, I, nowadays I say it has expanded. And the reason why I've changed my, my phrasing is that we had a big breach of our foreign ministry by the Russians. I was giving an interview to the local newspapers over here in Finland, and uh, the headline they printed was that Hyppönen says that spies have moved from the real world to the online world, because that's what I, what I said. Next day when the newspaper is out, my phone rings. It's an old friend of mine who works for uh, Finnish intelligence, and he tells me that, you know, Mikko, you're wrong. The spies have not moved from the real world to the online world. They have expanded. The real world spies haven't gone anywhere. The real world spies are still a thing. They still do what they do, human intelligence gathering and all that. And I totally agree. I mean, I'm a, I'm a geek. I'm a nerd. I work with computers. I don't see, I don't follow what real world spies do. That's completely out of my realm of expertise. So from my viewpoint, it looked like they had moved into my world. What he was telling me is that, no, they didn't move. They expanded. They're still there in the real world as well. And I agree. That's a good one. It makes me think of like if there was a monitor and then a second monitor, it would be that the original was the old kind of spying and then you would be on the second monitor and this would be an extend button. So you would have your material, but you were on the second monitor the whole time. So you're like, oh, the material is now coming to my monitor. So it's a good thing. Yeah. And, and stealing information has completely changed because how how easy data is to transform. Um, some of the biggest data thefts from U.S. government have been done physically walking out from um, air bases or, or military bases, carrying USB thumb drives or, or CD-ROMs. The amount of information you can put on one of them um, staggers the mind. In the old times, if you wanted to steal the same amount of information printed on paper, that would have been multiple truckloads full of paper. And you cannot drive multiple truckloads full of paper out of a military base without raising, raising uh, attention. But you can walk out carrying a CD-ROM, which is 600 megabytes of data, Lady Gaga written on top of it, so everybody thinks it's, it's music, and it's not. And this has actually happened. So it's, it's um, data theft is so different. And one thing about cyber weapons, which is important to understand, is that they're unique. They're, they're, they're quite different from any other kind of arms or weapons we have. You see real world weapons, um, tanks, missiles, aircraft carriers, fighter jets. Everybody knows that you have them. Um, and in fact, we want our enemies to know we have them. This is called deterrence. You make sure your enemy knows that you have a very powerful army and you will never be attacked. Um, prime example of this is, is the nuclear arms race. Nuclear weapons have been used in mankind's history two times. That's it. The rest of the power of the tens of thousands of nuclear warheads we have on this planet right now is in deterrence. There's 11 countries which have nuclear weapons. Those countries have never been challenged because they have nuclear weapons. Nobody wants to fight with them because they have nuclear weapons. You don't want to end up in a war with a country which has these kinds of weapons. So what's the deterrence power of, of other kinds of weapons? Well, you can go to Wikipedia and, and search for any country and their military and you will get a full list of how many fighter jets, how many tanks they have. Um, try to do the same search for cyber capabilities and you'll find nothing. Like what's the offensive cyber capability of Japan? I don't know. South Africa beats me. Sweden, I don't know. This is not public information. There's no way to show it. Whenever you have military parades, you never see the cyber attackers or cyber soldiers uh, you know, 
demonstrating their skills. Which means there is no deterrence power in cyber. Yet countries are spending massive amounts of money building both cyber defense, but also cyber offense. So massive amount of investment in new kinds of weapons which have no deterrence power at all. The only only return of investment those weapons could ever bring is that they would be used instead of being used for deterrence. And to make matters worse, cyber weapons rust, just like real weapons. If you take a new tank into use, its maximum life life cycle may be 50 years, typically 30 or something like that. After that, it's no longer functional. It's too old school. It's not up to date. It doesn't work anymore. It rusts away. Same thing applies to cyber weapons, and they are they have much shorter life cycle because cyber weapons target vulnerabilities in systems that the enemy is using. So what's the enemy using? Well, they're using Windows or they're using Linux. If you find a vulnerability, completely unknown hole from Windows 11 today, how long are you able to use that? If you create a weapon which would be able to take down or attack or breach the security of any Windows system on the planet today, will it still work six months from now, 12 months from now, 24 months from now? Assuming that you're not using it, you're just waiting, that you, know, you might need it one day, it's still going to get closed sooner or later because someone's going to find the hole and it's going to get reported to Microsoft and they will fix it. Or Windows will simply change. They will get rid, rid of some old code, including the vulnerability, and replace it with something else. So you have a limited window of time to use these weapons. And that's a problematic combination. When you have expensive weapons, which bring no deterrence power, but have a limited life cycle. That's not a really good combination to have. I like that you bring up this point on that if they are deterrents, then that's a big chunk of the value. But if there's no deterrents, then it's all in the defense or offense capabilities. It has to be there because it's not for this yeah. item. But cyber weapons make sense. Like they are effective, they are affordable, and they are deniable affordable, effective, deniable. That's a pretty good combination of features in a weapon. And the deniability is the most important one because that's that's unique. No other weapons have that. If you uh, you know attack a foreign country with tanks, it's kind of hard to deny that it's not us. You know, how are you going to deny that? <laughs> or if, if you fly a B-52 to drop bombs, everybody's going to see that that's a B-52. It has the US flag on its side. But when you use attacks like Stuxnet, um, you can keep denying them, and it's almost impossible to prove who did it. I told you 10 minutes ago that Stuxnet was done by U.S. government, actually U.S. government with the help of Israeli government. I actually can't prove that, and U.S. government is still denying that today. We know it was U.S. government with the help of Israelis. We simply can't prove it, and that's how good the deniability in cyber weapons can be. That's a great point. It's Is that right? You said obfuscated? It's obfuscated? Well, obfuscation is one of the things, but there's so much more you can do with cyber weapons to hide where it, they're really coming from that you cannot do with any other weapons. One other thing which we often see is false flag attacks, uh, where you're trying to make it look like the attack is coming from, from someone else. And that's really hard to track down. Um, if, 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 the, if the attack is done right, you completely end up believing that the, whoever's attacking you is completely innocent and the real attacker could be co completely different. Now, two things come to mind when you were describing that. Uh, one is recent news and one is person I know who works at um, local Department of Water and Power. They do internet security. Uh, and then the balloons that recently have been in different areas. Uh, what kind of potential security threats could be coming from through the balloons and or why would countries attack or a uh, department of water and power, for example, of a city. Hmm. The balloons is a mystery. I don't really have good, good ideas or, about what's going on. Um, obviously, the, the the one which we know was coming from China, which had all this gear on it. Um, obviously, it was for spying purposes, and and it might be that you get so much better 
pictures and so much better recording of radio connectivity from lower altitudes compared to satellites that it's worth it and it might actually be that steering these balloons isn't as hard as people often think they're not just drifting they can choose their height which means they can choose the winds and they did have some kind of uh, propulsion engine so it's not just that they would be drifting into random places they most likely could take them at least roughly to where they want it to be and if you are at the height of you know the same height where jets fly that's actually fairly low for for visual purposes compared to satellites which are in in, in atmosphere but i don't really know um or i believe that many of the other things which we've been or which have been seen um above north america over the last couple of days are the similar thing i think many of them are simply uh, you know, foil balloons which have escaped from a christmas party or, or birthday party or whatever and they just are found as they're floating very high up in the air but i have no insight into that really so i i, I not, don't want to speculate further i don't believe it's the aliens that's for sure <laughs> And the Department of Energy and Water, those are the kinds of things which we see being probed by, well, various kinds of attackers all the time. Now, to give some perspective to what this really means is that we are a security company. We have uh, 1,400 people working for us in 20 different countries. We do a lot of security work, including scanning the internet. We do it maybe twice a week. And when I say scanning the internet, I mean scanning the whole IPv4 address space, which is four to two billion addresses on the, uh, on the internet, which sounds like a lot, but it's not really that hard to scan all of them. Um, when we scan them, it's basically the, the same that you would walk through a city and try every door, try if, if the doors are open or closed. We try all the common ports on all of these public IP addresses just to see what's online. And whenever we look at the results, we see a lot of, co well, concerning things. Um, indeed, water and energy uh, distribution or cleaning facilities with their remote control systems exposed to public internet without firewalls or authentication. We see, um, all kinds of IoT devices, anything you could ever imagine, from fridges to security cameras, which anybody can control, security cameras that anybody can look at, which really makes no sense for security purposes. And we'll find, I don't know, ski lifts and uh, uh, hodl inside door systems and, and, and power generation, everything you could imagine. So simply the fact that somebody's scanning the net doesn't mean that they're doing anything bad. We're not doing anything bad when we when we do this. This is perfectly legal. If these are public addresses, we're just, you know, taking basically taking pictures in public space. That's the closest equivalent to what we're doing. But it might look like an attack from the defender's point of view. Someone, you know, tried our door to see if it was clock, lo locked or not. Um, then there are hobbyists who do this for. I don't know, shits and giggles. They try to find exciting places. Scanning, I don't know, NASA is very exciting. Well, we will find a satellite or something from SpaceX network. Um, and then, of course, we have nation states who do this as part of their daily work, uh, build visibility into foreign nations, try to figure out the infrastructure they operate built foothold which you might need later in case you have to do espionage or spying or even wage war in that foreign country with russia ukraine war we know that uh, gru of the russian military intelligence had spent months breaking into critical infrastructure networks in ukraine simply waiting for the war to break out on the 24th of february in 2022 when the real world war started the cyber attacks had started 12 hours earlier and the preparation for those attacks had started maybe a year earlier so they had been gaining access to critical infrastructure beforehand in case they knew need to do damage when the war started for real you know on that point of the attackers and when they do the damage you had a message in the book about how online attackers always have the upper hand. They can test against all security software before using their material in a real attack, kind of like checking it out. 
do they have is it completely lopsided as far as how quickly they have to attack when they do something such that you are taken off balance yep they they do have a clear upside then again they only have to make a mistake themselves to get to to to, to get caught. Um, so if you go to the dark side, if you tr start to break into systems, start to breaking break into a, into systems illegally, if you um, you know go to the wrong side, you are being hunted, and it only takes one mistake to 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 get caught. We were just investigating. We actually put out a report last week about a series of uh, investigations we did about single attacker targeting uh, medical systems in Europe and, and, and United States. And we found the attacker and the, the attacker made one mistake through this months long campaign. Every morning they would start the attacks and start probing into the networks they were going. And then one morning, one Tuesday morning, early on, they didn't enable cloaking for their IP addresses. They were always using these proxies or VPNs to hide where they were coming from. One morning, they forgot it for five minutes. Then they logged out, enabled the cloaking and logged back in. But that's enough. We, we got the real world address and we know now where they are. So they might have an upper hand in the sense that the attackers can always analyze how defenders work. They can always go and download all security software and spend unlimited time to analyze it and try to find ways around it. That's true, but it works the other way around as well. They only have to make a mistake once to get caught. And there's one specific area in this cat and mouse arms race between defenders and attackers where defenders actually have had an upper hand for more than a decade and that's in using machine learning um, for, for security purposes. I remember in 2005, 18 years ago, uh, we, we started to realize that we can't keep up with the amount of new malware samples. We had labs in different parts of the world. We were running 24 hours, three labs in eight hour shifts. So that's 24 hours, one lab in Helsinki, one in Malaysia, one in, in San Jose in California, covers the whole world. We were working like a machine and we started getting overwhelmed. We were getting so many samples despite running in three shifts every single day that after the end of the shifts, we, we would have samples unanalyzed. And the next day we would get even more samples. So we started to see that we cannot keep up. Regardless of how many new analysts we hire, this growth in stuff to be analyzed is faster than what we could ever recruit. So we started automating our work. We started to build labs automation, which basically we didn't call it back then, but it was, and it is still today, still today a, a machine learning framework. So we started to automate the human work done by human analysts, replace it with machines, which would collect these samples, analyze the samples, cross-reference them with all the old samples we have ever seen, and then make the call. Is this good or is this bad? Should we block this or should we let this run? Today, we do this 15 million times a day. It's not being done by humans, it's done by machines, machines which have taught themselves for 18 years. And now they are very good in making the call if something should be blocked or not. And, and all this time, all these 18 years, we've been waiting for the enemy to catch up and they still haven't. We are not seeing, not yet seeing malware campaigns being orchestrated by uh, machine learning frameworks. Um, this will happen right now. It seems it's going to happen in the very near future, maybe in the next six months. But, but all this time, we've had the upper hand. And when they finally are able to catch up, then we will see if good AI will be able to beat bad AI. It'll be the battle of AI at that point. Mm -hmm. That is innovative. Gosh. And then so that's like a head start on that end because, yes, you're using machine learning as companies. You have a framework, whereas the attackers are more... Uh, directed at a smaller, narrow item that they would like to take. One thing that I had thought of that connected to a past person, I had once spoken with uh, Dr. Dr. Temple Grandin, and she's more practical. Uh, she's autistic, but 
uh, has done worked with cattle movement and things like that, and had spoken about how computers used to be a open, like you would have, uh, from what I know, config.sys and system.ini and autoexec.bat, and you would edit files and everything was more open. Good time. Now, <laughs> long live editing, and now is more of a black box, and almost everything has become a black box of sorts. Is that better for security purposes for the average person so that the things that they could have um, messed up or damaged are put aside for experts? Can you speak on that, like black boxing of most, most of technology? It's not actually easy to answer the question because complexity is the enemy of security. The simpler we can make these systems, the better it is for security. However, making something appear simple to the user is not the same thing as making them simpler internally. The complexity is the enemy of security really means that the more complex systems we have, the more code we have, the more room we have for error, which means the more bugs we have and bugs then become vulnerabilities in interconnected systems. So reducing code would be the ultimate way of, of reducing vulnerabilities. Unfortunately, that's not what we're doing. We're adding code into every single system at, at every every stage. So I would really say that the best, best and the biggest improvement in security we've seen over the last 15 years has been the introduction of these more reduced systems. And my favorite example probably is things like these. Like, you know, when you compare a modern smartphone or a modern tablet, like an iPad, to a computer, you take an iPad, um, you can do everything you can do with a computer with an iPad, especially if you add a keyboard. And, you know, it's full blown, it, full blown computer in every respect except one. And that is crucial. This is not a computer, this is not programmable by the end user. If you have a computer on your desk and if you know how to program, you can just sit down with the computer and write a program and run it on that computer. This is different. This is a closed system. This is not programmable by the end user at all. This is a PlayStation, PlayStation or an Xbox. That's a computer as well. Clearly, I mean, Xbox actually even runs Windows. It's a computer with a CPU, RAM, storage, internet connection. However, it's a computer, even, even though you own that computer, you don't have the right to program that computer. And it's a very safe computer because of that restriction. You never hear about viruses on Xboxes or Playstations, do you? And exactly the same thing to, applies to these things. So it's a trade-off. We give away the right to program this thing. And in exchange, we get much better security. And that's the biggest security improvement we've seen in the last 15 years. That's a great way to describe it. it, it it's also interesting when you think about Xbox in particular, um, Xbox is made by Microsoft, the biggest software company on the planet. Their biggest selling operating system, of course, is Windows. There's tons of different versions of Windows, but the most secure version of Windows is inside games console, which is a bit funny, isn't it? You would think the most secure version of Windows would be in some secure laptop or, or maybe some payment terminal. No, it's in Xbox. Xbox Windows is really locked down. It only only does IPv encrypted network connectivity, nothing else. It only runs signed, whitelisted binaries. It will not run anything else. It only runs on specific hardware with certificate keys inside the hardware. Very, very secure system because they have to secure the, 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 the computer against the owner of the computer as well. They do all of this to make cheating in games harder and piracy harder. But there's an added benefit, which is that it's also very secure device and it's exactly the same model we have in our iPhones and I iPads. That's a great point about how some parts are really locked down where there will be a lot of users keep it simple for the end user and then where you would think it would be really locked down it's not as much in mm -hmm. some cases. That's true. Actually I'll throw that in there actually too. Uh, Windows, Linux, Mac, when you think about uh, the three of them any differences in security that come to mind and just by default? Well, Linux is by far the most common operating system on the planet. Linux runs the world. Windows is the operating system you see the most, especially on computers. Um, 
but when you go beyond the computers you have on your on your desk before the MacBook running um, Mac OS, which is a BSD Linux variant or Windows from Microsoft, then in the actual servers and in the cloud and big part of the IoT world around us, that's being run by Linux. And of course, I have a deep preference for Linux myself because it comes from my home country of Finland. I, I used to regularly meet Linus Torvalds when he was still studying at the Helsinki University. Uh, he's been living in Oregon for more than 10 years or maybe 15 years now. But um, it, it really did change the world because it is open source and it has enabled whole whole movement of where systems are being built together by people all over the planet, over the internet. That wasn't really a thing and now it is a big thing. So Linux did change the world. Um, Apple has done massive... Uh, shift in, in how you build privacy respecting systems. When you look at how Apple does their money, it's completely different from, for example, how Google makes their money or how Facebook makes their money. Google and Facebook try to collect as much information about us as possible to then throw ads, ads into our face. Apple doesn't do that. Apple instead makes their money by selling overpriced hardware for us. And they're really capitalizing on this difference by making sure that they actually don't collect information that they could. So for example, when you pay with Apple Pay from your iPhone or from your Apple Watch, obviously Apple could collect that information. And it's quite easy to see how collecting information what, about what you're buying is, is valuable. Like here's a person who buys these kinds of things. That's easy to monetize. Apple doesn't take that information. They could, but they don't. When you pay with Google Pay, they do take the information. Same thing with, with all the other systems. And this is how Apple tries to differentiate themselves. Microsoft is also a great example of a company who were able to change their attitude towards security. Windows used to be the worst. It was so easy to break into Windows computers. But for the last 20 years, Microsoft has been investing more and more into their security, and now it's actually very, very good in security. All of the big companies um, invest millions and millions in their online security. So what really makes these three players different is that Microsoft and Apple are closed, and Linux is open. And open source, I'd like to think, will always win in the end, because it needs us to work together and everybody can work together to make it work. It's always the year of Linux, as you would say. My last question to you is, by the way, I have to point out, I always point out things directly, very valuable information. And it makes me, reading the material makes me feel, I don't know, like a good sense of the world. It's gonna seem very like uh, personal, but that you exist, it makes the world seem better. I don't know, like more managed. So I like that. It's a nice thing, like the fact that there are wonderful individuals managing parts of the world is, is fabulous. What what would be a message you would have from the book that you would want people to take away a, um, a couple of sentences that would take uh, be a takeaway message of the book? Well, I already said that the, the phrase I repeat most often, which is that the internet is the best thing and the worst thing during our time. But the upsides are much bigger than the downsides. And technology, brings us benefits, but also new risks. And when we invent something, we cannot uninvent it. Once something has been invented, it's with us forever. We cannot make inventions go away. The only thing we can try to do with inventions that we think are bad or dangerous is that we can try to make them illegal. Now, when we look at technological innovations, which, which are problematic, it's easy to come up with examples, like strong encryption, uncrackable encryption which is great for privacy, and it's awful when terrorists use it. But once something like that has been invented, we cannot make it go away. The only thing we could do is to make using strong encryption illegal, and if that would be the case, then you and me, Armand, then we wouldn't be using strong encryption because we are law-abiding citizens. We wouldn't break the laws. But you know who breaks the laws? Criminals break the laws. So if we pass a law saying that you must not use this strong 
secure technology, then the only ones using it would be criminals. And, and that's exactly what we don't want to end up with. Nico, I would like to thank you for having joined for this discussion, bringing a bit of information about your wonderful book, If It's Smart, It's Vulnerable, and bringing us a sense of where cybersecurity is at the current time on the planet. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Armin. Very glad to. And we are out.